the Lessons Learned podcast for today, July the 4th, 2018. Usually I don't say the date, but it is a holiday in the United States, and we're going to be talking about America, 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 America. <laughs> so uh, might as well just point that out. Uh, well, myself, uh, Lessons Learned, of course, uh, my co-host, Chapelman. And uh, we were just discussing before the program started uh, about the news, as they, as it were, uh, which, you know, we're going to keep saying this probably until October, November. Uh, there's really not a lot of news. Um, let's start with uh, Fallout 76 and or more to the point. Let's start with uh, Todd Howard and, and members of the uh, Bethesda Upworks team saying essentially they would love to have crossplay with Sony, Microsoft, and everyone else who's going to be involved. And PC, I don't think it's going to be out for Twitch. Uh, but Sony doesn't want to cooperate. Mm. And there we go again. It's another... I don't know if you would call it a black eye because it doesn't seem like Sony cares. Mm -hmm. But is it, I guess it lends more credibility to what we already heard about this, right? Uh, but not necessarily uh, anything particularly new in the news. So it's like, yeah, kind of knew that was happening. Um, it's just a matter of, I don't, again, like we said last week, I think it's a matter of whether Sony or not wants to play, you know, um, play ball. And I think I heard someone say that, I think it was in the no, uh, they were discussing this. And it's like, it if you're in a dominant position, and it was a very interesting take on it. If you're in a dominant position, you don't want to share. Mm -hmm. But having cross-play is a good way of safeguarding yourself for when... <laughs> You're, you're not, not on, on top. You're not on top, right? And if the next time in around 2020, 2021, if Sony is a company that is not, you know, strong, coming strong out the gate, then they may want to go do crossplay. And I think, in fact, uh, one of the things that was noticed that Sony actually said yes to crossplay um, some time ago, and it was Microsoft who said, no, we don't want to do crossplay. Mm hmm. But now that Microsoft is the underdog in this generation between Nintendo and Sony, they're saying, oh, cross-break, cross-break, cross-play. Which, um, and then tying this to the stuff we talked even the week before that on cross-play, um, I would say that I think Microsoft is sort of trying to position itself as in this, you know, the end of the cycle for the next cycle is being, you know, the consumer friendly, um, you know, company versus Sony who is not playing ball. But, which is the kind of ironic how they started this generation seeing uh, being seen as like the anti-consumer company with the uh, always online DRM mm -hmm. for the Xbox One. <laughs> Which ties in what we were talking before about corporate arrogance, right? Uh, yeah. You know, Sony came out of the gate when they, with the PlayStation 1, uh, kind of sort of humble because Nintendo and Sega were still dominating. Sega fell out of the way. Nintendo fell back. Microsoft comes in. Uh, during the PlayStation 2 era, Sony was still playing it humble. You know, so there was a competition. But when PlayStation, dom Sony dominated, you know, two generations back to back, they said, oh, we're now on PlayStation 3, we're going to be, you know, a bit arrogant. Mm -hmm. And that, with other other things, actual costs and stuff like that, probably helped the 360 becoming the dominant platform in that generation. And then Microsoft came out saying, okay, we're now in a dominant position. Everybody's going to do what we say. And we was like, no, we don't. And it was... I remember those spots that, you know, Sony said, oh, how do you share uh, games with your friends? And, you know, there was that video where they just handed a disc to someone. It's like, hey, you know, right? Making fun of the whole thing. Um, of course, it also shows that Sony at the time there, and, and this is also a problem with J the Japanese developers across the board, their online uh, support has always been weaker than Microsoft's. Let's be honest. Microsoft has dominated that space. Yeah. Uh, whether they have sales or not to back it up, but they're always being, you know, on the forefront of that. So I think it made sense for them to sort of move fully into that. 
uh, as much as possible, but they, they came off as being very arrogant. It's like, well, if you don't like this, well, screw you, et cetera, et cetera. That gave an opening to Sony, sales to, took off, and now it seems that Sony's, or Microsoft is trying to position, and uh, uh, I think this is also might be companies sort of signaling to Sony, like, hey, listen, Crossplay is good for everyone. Yeah, get off your high horse. Yeah, we're willing to play ball. We're not going to get the blame for this. Just because, you know, you were dominant before doesn't mean today doesn't mean you're going to be dominant tomorrow. And we are the ones because, you know, software leads really sells. If you don't have good games as Microsoft has, you know, experience, they don't have enough strong, you know, first party games, you're not going to dominate. Right. And also what happened mm -hmm. to the Wii U, right? A lot of companies just pull back and say, nah, we're not going to do software for the Wii U. And while the Wii U has some good games, the which is ironic because many of the games that have pushed the Switch to the forefront were first-party games anyway, just like the Wii U and the Wii before it, but they were not seen as being as strong as what came af before or after, right? So, yeah. Well, of course, Nintendo plays their own game, and their, their, their long game is, is, is a bit different. But still, <laughs> uh, so I think it's I think it's a combination of things. A combination of Sony not wanting to give up the dominant position, Microsoft trying to sort of grease the wheels for twenty. I, I think they're thinking. I'm thinking tw late 2019, 2020. We're really gonna know one way or the other. And companies like Bethesda saying, "Hey, listen, you know we're not gonna we're not gonna take the fall for this if this becomes a big thing." Yeah, uh, and you know it's interesting with the uh, with the direction every company is going. Mm -hmm. The fact that they want to make every single game a life service. Like, mm -hmm. what does that mean for for a business model like that? If one of the your major markets doesn't want to play with the rest of your market. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also. I mean, again, uh, because we talked about this before, it's what really is important is daily concurrent users. And if you can draw in from the larger the pool of daily concurrent users you have, whether they're Sony and PlayStation stuff or Xbox or whatever they're going to name it this time around, probably going to be Xbox something other, uh, or your PC or Switch or whatever, the larger that number is, the better. And look at the games that are dominating now, like Fortnite and PUBG, stuff like that. They work because they have a lot of players, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, the larger your overall uh, population base, that means that that 5 to 10% of people that are actually paying the money in microtransactions where the real money is, they're going to be the ones, you know, that push and keep these services alive and they really make the, the, the multi-millions and billions of dollars that these games are making. Look at GTA V, for example. If crossplay makes that easier, because it, I think the developers... The publishers don't really care about particular platforms other than whether this platform can support what we're trying to do. You know, the more the platforms, the better. They'll 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 put their games whenever, wherever they think they can put them, no matter what, right? Yeah. It's just it's just a, it's all about the numbers. So which brings us to EA. And EA saying essentially, oh, yeah, Command & Conquer on mobile. Well, you know, people are saying that mobile is not serious enough, blah, 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 blah. And it comes out as a very weak defense of a very stupid move by Electronic Arts. Yeah, it's essentially them trying to, like, say, hey, we, we're, we're trying to bring uh, Command & Conquer to a new generation and a new media where it's more accessible to more players and more buzzwords, buzzwords, buzzwords. With nothing really to show for it. I mean, yeah, I, I suppose you can make it on, on mobile if you, I mean, again, RTS, or particularly RTS like, um, like Command & Conquer, which is one of the classics, bad boxing is important. So I guess, can you draw accurately uh squares and stuff like that quickly enough or we're gonna go like halo uh, where they had to do like a radio menu and stuff like that which is not quite the rts experience from hmm. a pc perspective right uh i mean i i thought that maybe one of the things i thought about the touch pad in the playstation 4 
was that that would actually allow for a grow in RTSs on the PlayStation, but apparently that's not the market Sony's looking for anyway, so... No, the touchpad's a little weird on mm-hmm. on the PlayStation. It, some games use it, but most games don't. Yeah, it's just an add-on, I suppose. I just throw in and hope... Yeah, it's, it it's an extra button, too, because essentially, since they took your select button, I guess you would call it, or your start button, mm-hmm. they took out one of those to make it a share button. So your touchpad, you have to... It's a big pushable button and that's your like select now Mm. for most games it tends to be the map button so it's just a big button that's it yep (laughs) i I mean there's some games where you can lightly touch it and sometimes you can make it like a a mouse cursor appear Mm -hmm. yeah uh i mean even even valve has had a problem emulating the mouse on a controller Uh, i mean there are some controls out there versions of the valve controller the steam controller that are out there but so far they never really perfected it to to the point where it really was economically viable like i don't i don't i don't know anybody who has a has a steam controller Mm -mm. i've heard some good things about it but it was inconsistent across platforms and games so that was a problem right and and when you have a control device you need consistency Right, you need that. I it's it, okay. An example is that I playing Fable on anniversary. Now I have the original Fable for PC uh, with the lost chapters. I think I have all the disc here. But one of the things that you cannot do is it doesn't it doesn't come with con- native controller support. And mm-hmm. even if it did, it would probably come with controller support for the original Xbox because that's when it came out. Yeah, uh, and so you would have to remap. And I'm always leery of remapping keys because they feel a bit off, like loose. Like, okay, is this really the key that I want to press? Uh, it always something. There's something's always off. With. And for example, I've been playing Fallout Three, and since I play Fallout Three mostly with the controller on the P on well early on the PC and also on the um, on the Xbox 360, when I tried it with the keyboard and mouse, yes, my shooting was a tad more accurate Mm -hmm. but again i was sort of searching for buttons stuff like that you know getting the right control scheme for the right game and having that control scheme be as consistent as possible throughout as many games as possible is key for a successful control scheme otherwise it's you know unless you're buying like a flight stick or a fight stick for specific games it's a waste of time yeah I mean, that's one of the reasons why the Xbox 360 and now the Xbox, the Xbox X controller is far more popular than the actual platform that it supports because it is a good controller, you know, and it's something that a lot of developers are saying, okay, we know how this works and we can use it in almost any single game out there. And that's why there's more controller support especially on PC. So there you go. I mean, that's. And again, the Wii U, that's one of the things that happened with controller. The, your Wii U was, they try to put that uh, pad into it and that, that screen, which is not the first game yeah. to do that. So, so it was this giant thing, which kind of like was square and didn't really work. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why they made the Switch the way it is. It's much smaller. And also, one of the things that Nintendo did very off the bat was, I don't know, we have pro controllers and we can do if you want to do the this other controller we can do that as well if you want to go all the way back to a uh, nes controller sure go ahead uh talking about nintendo there's being some patent that nintendo has uh re- either renewed or launched that point at a game cube classic maybe I don't. I mean, I wish. Well, I to be honest, I would like to just. It's much easier to get a, your hold of a original console than one of these classics, right? Sort of, well, sort of. Um, I believe the the GameCube is not that hard to get a hold of. Mm. The software, on the other hand, is ridiculously expensive. I always see first party Nintendo software for GameCube going usually uh, thirty five to fifty five dollars. Yeah, I think it's the mini disc. Um, yeah, and they're the mini disc. Well, yeah, a lot of those things don't survive the 
the time. Were there any? I mean, I, I guess I remember that the GameCube had a lot of Pokemon games. Mm -hmm. uh, it ran on Pokemon, basically. Uh, I think it, Sun and Moon first came out for the GameCube, if I'm not mistaken. Was I it? think it was. I think it was uh, Emerald or, or Ruby and Sapphire. Uh -huh. And then Leaf Green, Blue, Red, Fire. <laughs> yeah. And also there were some Zelda games. I think Ocarina of Time was for the, uh, the... the yeah the the Master Quest version. There mm -hmm. was the Wind Waker, mm -hmm. and there was Twilight Princess, which is was towards the end of the console's life. Yeah, and I think there was at least one Star Wars game that I remember was a sh kind of like third person sort of shoot him not shoot him up, but it was like Star Fighters and stuff like that. But I don't remember a lot of support for the GameCube. I mean, I remember no. it existed, but you know, wasn't it wasn't a, it wasn't as popular a platform. It was actually very powerful for, for what it was, but the combination of Nintendo sort of falling out of favor using mini disc, which is sort of a half disc format, and a bunch of other decisions, just also was one of the first that was explicitly designed to be portable, like it had a handle and everything. Yeah, uh, so you can take it around. <laughs> I guess because you know, um, so there was that. Uh, I mean, I guess, yeah, the reason why I would get a, a, an NES Classic, which you can't get because it was a limited edition run, or a Super NES Classic because it was another limited edition. I'm not going to go to eBay and pay $600 for them. That's ridiculous. Um, yeah, getting the hardware is easy. Getting all the cartridges, that's where the real expense comes from. Yeah, so uh, I can see people welcoming a GameCube, um, a GameCube Mini because mm -hmm. the... The big issue is the cartridges. They're, it's so expensive to buy a game for them, and they're really rare because it didn't. The system didn't sell very well. Mm -hmm. Even though there, there's some games that are marked as like you know best sellers of the GameCube game, like Paper Mario and mm -hmm. Mario Sunshine. But yeah, for the most part, those games were were didn't sell very well, even if they were the best that the console had to offer. So their rarity nowadays is really high. Mm. I think there might be a market for it. Yeah, the the only downside that I could see with the mini is it's not going to use, it's not going to have like a lot of the main features that that the mini that the actual console has, like four player support. There's a lot of games that use four player support. I'm not sure if it's going to have four ports. One of the biggest things was the Game Boy Player, which uh, lets you play. Game Boy, Game Boy Games, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance. Mm. Oh, and that kind of makes sense. That would that would be. I mean, Game Boy was the the platform that really was keeping Nintendo afloat through those years. Yeah, you know, it's one that sold uh, sold everyone. Um, you know, so so I, yeah, a lot of those staples I could see not making it to the console mini. Yeah, it also depends. Well, again, Nintendo had a lot of first party support for their machines always have but i think there's a couple of games that are third party that people might want to see that they might not get to see mm -hmm. if the if that's the thing um, probably probably crystal chronicles the game the consoles that i really want to see and and sega basically decided to do this through software and i saw i seen several reviews of this like sega keeps uh, putting the same collection of games out and it gets seems to get worse and worse as they try to emulate it. I guess they're emulating out of an emulator, of an emu so it gets gets worse. But I would love to see, for example, if not a software emulation, then uh, a, a hardware version of, say, um, the last Sega, uh, you know, the Dreamcast. Because I yeah. play, I I didn't I almost got this close to guy in a Dreamcast, uh, but when I played it, it really impressed me. And it was supposed to be the machine that was going to bring Sega back, and it was going to dominate the first years of the 21st century. And it came out in 1999. By the year 2000, Actually, it was gone. Yeah, I think I think it was the only one that had the. It might have been the first console that had had a, like an internet connection. No, no, there have been consoles that had an internet connection before, but none of the main uh, consoles like Nintendo, Sega, and I think PlayStation had a kit that you could add to with the PlayStation One and Two. That had uh, internet connection. Uh, they were the ones who really had Sega really had a an infrastructure for it. That's the thing. 
and it was it was it was not high speed internet. It was still you know dial up modem. Dial up. <laughs> uh, and it also had a very popular uh, MMO, uh, which was something something I think Panzer Dragoon or something like that. No, it was something something Dragon. Uh, but it was it was a huge hit um, by itself. But it wasn't enough to sustain the Dreamcast for too long. Let me check uh, Dreamcast MMO. M N M M O something something dragon. <laughs> M M O. Uh, Phantom Star or, or uh, Fantasy fan Star? Fantasy, Fantasy Star. I don't know why I say dragons? I, I guess oh, I was thinking. I was thinking. I'm sure it has dragons in there. <laughs> yeah, no, but actually, it was a sci-fi um, style um, MMO. It wasn't. Well, it was sci-fi fantasy style, uh, and it was very popular. Um, and uh, in basically, it's been up to recent years. I okay, we now you compare Destiny stuff like that. It's been one of the most popular uh, console-based MMOs in history. Uh, and it sold very well. I think it lasted for about ten years. Uh, I guess it might have migrated to PC or some other platforms. But um, yeah, I would like to see a Dreamcast, a Dreamcast Mini or a reboot. I mean, I seen every other day. I see a version of the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, and it's like, okay, yeah, sure, whatever, right? I saw a Commodore, a, a Mini Sixty Four, for the Commodore Sixty Four. Which was okay, except you actually couldn't use the keyboard, which is like what's supposed to be a computer, but I guess it's just a form factor. I mean, there's a lot of machines that are coming out, and Nintendo's certainly riding the waves of um, the retro nostalgia thing, of sort of having the package thing. But most of them are not that good. No. Like, it's still emulator. Mm -hmm. Like, the the other day I came home and I, I found my boyfriend playing... Um, was it Yoshi's Story on mm -hmm. just playing Yoshi's Story on our um, our Super Nintendo? And I'm like, you know, you have like the NES one with like a wireless controller that you got first. Like, yeah, but I wanted to play this one because the sound, the music sounds more familiar. Mm -hmm. Like the music sounds slightly different because it's not it's software emulation mm -hmm. it's not hardware and you did you did bring up an interesting idea i i i guess it's way too expensive but why not make like i guess native hardware like native hardware but have it have the software all in it like console wise well i seen for example the pies the pie sort of pie boards mm -hmm. being used to uh create like mini uh arcade cabinets uh, and so you can cram like 5, 10, 15, you know, use USBs and you put as many games as you want. Again, those are emulated. I mean, the older the the games, in one way, it's easier to emulate them. But one thing that happens with, uh, because I'm watching a lot of, uh, you know, vintage modern gamer. Uh, so if you want to say that, oh, he's an Australian modder and software programmer. He basically mods consoles to play not only older games but games from other consoles also done some you know with mame and stuff like that and one of the things he pointed out in the last video i saw was that it isn't just simply raw power of modern machines so they go oh, you know i have a machine that's 10 15 20 50 times more powerful than what that they were doing it's just that most of the consoles had proprietary hardware mm -hmm. and so you know special sound chips special memory and ROMs and stuff like that. And as, as well as actually when you talk about cartridge-based uh, software, the, most of the hardware is in the cartridge. Essentially, what you have in the machine is a, is a cartridge re a reader and interpreter with some, mm -hmm. you know, with some RAM and something like that. That's, that's one of the reasons cartridges were so popular is well because the hardware could be kept cheap, right? Uh, you didn't have to invest as much and you could put specialized stuff in the, in the cartridge more extra memory, other, you know, save batteries, that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, when you try to emulate that in software, you're making the software work double time or triple time, right? And that means it takes far more resources to do so. I tried to get, and by the way, here in the Lessons Learned podcast, we do not encourage piracy. 
uh, we only encourage emulation when it is very difficult or not impossible to play or find the originals for you. Uh, but if you want to try emulation, there's an entire emulation scene out there. It's not technically illegal, but again, it's not technically legal. So I want you, I want everybody to know where they're standing with this. Uh, but while I was looking at forward, looking at Xbox emulation, Xbox OC, because I love, I mean, mm -hmm. I have a bunch of games. I have a somewhere around here that my old Xbox is taking in like, it broke down. I think it was a hard drive or something. Never played it again. I don't have the controllers or the brick or anything like that, but I just have the Xbox. I don't know where the parts went. Um, and I was like, well, I can't really go and get an Xbox in the store. Like I said before, I would like to play like the old Robotech games on my PC. I would like to get maybe, you know, Crimson Skies, which was a pretty cool game that came out for the Xbox OC. Um, other games I can get on PC, like KOTOR and stuff like that. But I would like to play that. Well, because of the both anti-piracy measures that uh, uh, Xbox had on their consoles, as well as the, um, the uniqueness of the hardware, it the list of actual, in the few emulators that are out there for free, um, you can't really charge for it because you're emulating you know, proprietary hardware and software. Um, the, the amount of games that could be reliably emulated was very low like half a dozen titles at most. So I think re-releasing re all hardware or like Microsoft has been doing this for a while, but they usually been doing it for just one generation removed. They've been talking about 360 titles. I haven't seen a lot of original Xbox titles that they brought to the Xbox X or the Xbox One. Yeah. Uh, which I wish, I, I mean, if they were to bring all those titles back, I might have tried the Xbox. Uh, Xbox One, Xbox One X, right? Because I had the 360, so I don't, I don't feel like I want to replay all those titles. And most of the 360 titles, I can get on PC. Again, the kind of thing that happens hard in in consoles is, as time goes by, is all those exclusives. Those other things are very important. Uh, if I can't get access to the exclusives, why do I want to play Kotor again? I'm not Kotor, but Mass Effect again on Xbox. One or Xbox One X when I have the PC version of it, mm -hmm. or can still boot it up in my 360 that works. I mean, I don't, I don't see the the, and there's there's limitations. Yeah, and like I was trying to say, so I think Nintendo could probably afford to, but make smaller versions of their original hardware, mm -hmm. the like what was in the cartridges and what was on the on the motherboard of say a Super Nintendo and get like essentially perfect emulation because yeah. i mean it's it's years it's been decades later i'm sure they can make the same hardware the same proprietary hardware on, on a smaller version and mm -hmm. make it work with whatever interface it has where you can have multiple games and load it up and whatnot but it's probably not worth the time investment and returns well the thing about it is that in essence you'll be emulating hardware uh the thing about a lot of these things, and let me tell a story about the Commodore 64, which is a machine I'm very familiar with because I owned it for many years. One of the problems happened to the Commodore 64 is that when it came out, it has things like the MOS chip, which allowed for sounds and all that. After a while, it became too expensive. Even though the technology was aging quickly, it became too expensive for common business machines to keep making the same chipset because of its rarity because mm -hmm. uh manufacturers have moved on to new hardware it's a very strange thing about hardware if you keep making the same thing year after year yes the prices drop like for example if you want to get like a walkman or a discman or the equivalent today you can go to target and get it for like 20 bucks because you know companies are still making them you can get a vcr for like 50 bucks a C, uh, you know, CD player or uh, or DVD player for like 50 bucks, something like that, because people are still making them. But once support for that hardware stops, in essence, you have to recreate hardware that nobody knows how to make for a relatively small market. And that actually creates a spite, uh, a spite of, uh, of, tr of, of, of um, not a huge spike, but 
a, a spike in cost. So the easiest way to do is to use modern hardware to kind of emulate old hardware. And and you see this a lot again in the in the especially in the PC scene. Like people are remaking at lip cards and stuff like that. Uh, so that you can take your, you know, your 386 or your 486 and sort of create, uh, you know, remake it as it were in the 1995, for example, so you can play your own reels or your dooms, etc. in the original hardware. Um, but that's a very small scene for very specialized um, collectors. There's a lot of them out there, but for, say, a company like Microsoft, trying to recreate all Atlib hardware for PCs in, in the mid-1990s, or Nintendo try to recreate the hardware of an NES or even a Famicom, might not be worth the cost of having to retool a factory or something like that in China to make a chipset of things that... Yeah, yeah I, I can still, sell there. You can make it cheaper, you know, and in a way it is will be cheaper. In one, one way it will be cheaper, you can make it smaller... You know, you could substitute the the cartridge board for like what the you know the the um, this the switch uses, which is are those you know this hard memory, uh, etc. You could do all that, uh, but there comes a point where it sort of tips over, and the the cost of emulating the hard, all hardware directly, like we, we, you know the same chips, etc., but saving putting more RAM onto them or faster RAM or stuff like that, or with USB connections and. It kind of becomes like a Frankenstein thing where it, it doesn't really work. Uh, it's it's doable, but and it's not as expensive as original hardware would be when they first came out, of course, with the R and D and all that. But you have to look at how many people are wanting to sell, and also Nintendo likes to have like rarity. Like they send the mini mm-hmm. and so the hundred a million machines, and oh, we're out of that, and you know that's what they're not doing the virtual. Um, uh, the virtual console with your console uh on the switch is because they can still sell hardware on on nostalgia and once they i think once they reach something like i think they reached the wii the original wii <laughs> or something like that they're gonna go okay fine virtual console and you know they're they're gonna so there there, there you go i mean it's uh emulating all stuff it's complicated mm-hmm. uh, even companies like gog which uh take quite a bit of time and effort to bring all games back when you play those games sometimes they're, they're unplayable in spite of their best efforts so yeah so uh, moving on also with electronic arts and this time our all whipping boy bioware particularly andromeda what do we what do you, Chema, Chema, why don't you tell our viewers exactly what uh, what's happening with that so a director for a for um the a director for anthem he was asked during an interview during a bunch of rapid fire questions if uh, Andromeda got a fair shake and he doesn't believe so. And he essentially, when he was asked to elaborate, he blamed that it came out at the same time as uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild. He later went on on Twitter and elaborated a little more saying that that it came, that in Mass Effect Andromeda came out during a crowded launch window with other games such as... Uh, Near Automata, Nero, Zero, Horizon Zero Dawn, and of course, Breath of the Wild. And he solely blames that on uh, why Mass Effect got, got the rating it did, because there were better games out at the time, so therefore they game looked worse in comparison. So maybe if it didn't come out with those games, it could have turned a 72 into maybe a 77, 78, which isn't that much more <laughs> hmm. i mean first of all whenever you talk about you know that kind of scores meta scores metacritic i'm like <laughs> that's, that's yeah not, that's not a really measure of anything other than perhaps popularity um not quality second i think it's just making excuses yeah, he does. He does come out and say like, "Oh, you know, Mass Effect and Drama did have its flaws, but you know, I didn't think it was that bad." But I, I have to disagree with him, like scrutinizing Mass Effect and Drama because all these other games launched at the same time. The only game out of all of those I didn't even play was a uh, 
Zelda Breath of the Wild, which I didn't actually play. I just watched my boyfriend play that. And I would have never really compared that to Mass Effect Andromeda. I had no interest in any of the other games that were released at the time other than Mass Effect Andromeda, and I already knew it was going to be crap based on everything Bioware themselves have shown me about the game, so I didn't buy it. Mm -hmm. And once I actually did play it, the only games I compared it to really was the other Mass Effect games and Ma and Dragon Age Inquisition because I saw a lot of similarities with it. I so, so to say that the we were comparing it to those other games just seems kind of ridiculous. I mean, uh, Mass Effect had enough of a, a base of people that they could they had or could recapture with a solid game that I don't think you know people who play Mass Effect I guess would not have gone for. Uh, it's not like they were completely with like Call of Duty or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, such a such a big game, uh, Destiny or something like that. It it wipe out everybody on the board. The fact that all these other games, especially very smaller games, came out at the same time and were successful. You know, yes, you can make an argument that it was a bit of a crowded field, but not too crowded. After all, it was EA's decision to delay the game. They decided when to publish it. So, is that a dig yeah. at EA saying, "Hey, you screwed us," you know? And this is not to also to say that it didn't it didn't do well in terms of it didn't sell well. It he's mostly talking about that it didn't get reviewed as well or seen as good as as it maybe it could have been, I guess. Which again, no, not not with that story, not what what we've come to anticipate with with Bioware, the quality, the level of quality with Bioware. Yeah. No, I mean. Giving a fair shake, I wanted to give it a fair shake. I played the I... demo. You played the 24-hour stream. I played the entire trilogy plus Mass of Andromeda back-to-back -back earlier this year. Uh, yeah, we tried. I really wanted to find stuff in Andromeda to really love the way I love stuff. That's broken and, and sometimes, you know the problems that the original trilogy had, but I could never really find it. I only found one, well, maybe two, but really one scene that really moved me. Like, oh, this is an, uh, uh, you know, really is like had a real impact on me. That was about 10 hours into the game, something like that. Where, yeah. Where, you know, the original Mass Effect for, well, again, all the problems that it has, especially sort of this kind of big, boring middle that it has, it grabbed me from the beginning, right? And and that was a game that I found hard to keep playing because I found the the UI difficult to to process. But I kept going at it because, like, no, there, I I want to see what this game has to offer, and I did. That would not have been my experience with a drama. Though. You know, drama was like, well, I'm playing this game, and I'm playing this game, and I'm still playing this game, and I played the game, and I experienced the game. And that was it, right? That was it. It's, you know, like I said, when I played it, demo, and then I played the, the game. It was like it was it was meh. So those met ironically, those Metacritic scores kind of show in their own way that that's what the game was about, right? It wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't a spectacular game, and it could have come out by itself, and people would have. I think if it came out on an uncrowded field, it would have been worse, because. Who do you compare it to? Mass Effect, right? Mm -hmm. And compared to Mass Effect, it would have been a very a big letdown. And it was a big letdown. So I think it's more also for people preparing for me, perhaps the critical uh, reception that an Anthem may get. Yeah. Because a lot of people are talking about Anthem going like, mm, again, it doesn't look like much. It's not that impressive. It doesn't. It's not blowing us away. It's just yeah. looking okay. Yeah, looking like another Destiny clone, MMO light stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But people were really excited about uh, Assassin's Creed uh, Origins, Origins, and Origins, and and what's the one that uh, is supposed to go out now? Well, whatever Assassin's Creed is coming out next year, and or, I think it's this year. I'm not really sure when it's going to come out. I think it's next year, uh, and the and some other games. Even showing a, a scintilla of Doom and um, games like um, The Elder Scrolls Six, 
Yeah, just the just the title. <laughs> just had people far more excited than whatever they were showing in Anthem. So it's like, yeah, the excitement level is not there. And it, whoop, my chair. <laughs> uh, my chair, I decided to create them in there. Uh, we were going to go like, well, you can't. And I think that also speaks to the hype machine, right? And how dependent these games are on the hype machine, right? If people are not really excited about the game, you don't get that momentum. And when the game hits, it's sort of, it just sort of keeps prodding on. And I think that's all we have for news, unless I'm uh, mistaken, this mm -hmm. week. So with 20 minutes to go to the hour, we're finally, finally going to get to our subject today, which is a big, expansive subject. I'm, I'm going to try to narrow it quite a bit. As the title of the podcast says, we're going to be talking about America's influence on video games. Now, that seems like a duh title. Yes, America has influence on video games. But let's look at it this way. Let's look at games that are not necessarily American made, but are still heavily influenced by the wants, needs, and views of the American market as a way of showcasing the impact, right? Don't don't tell me that Call of Duty has a big impact worldwide because it sells a lot of games. Let's look at those things like Far Cry series. Let's look at um, and other companies like Ubisoft and other companies that are Square Enix that are not American companies. Yeah, but they definitely like to tailor a market to American companies. And, or to American audiences. Yeah. And and design decisions and themes and ideas. So, I mean, let's start with Bioware. Bioware is a, well, got bought up by EA, which is an American publisher, clearly. But Bioware was, for the most time, was a Canadian company. Now, you can say North America, very similar cultural, linguistic, historical backgrounds. But you're not exactly the same country, right? Mm -hmm. And yet consistently the games that Bioware have made can easily be, you could easily say, oh, Bioware is an American company because it has that American lens. Like the first, one of the first games they were known for was Dungeons and Dragons, right? And Dungeons and Dragons, yes, it, it has a lot of that Western fantasy, especially Tolkien and Moorcock and others, but it's a particular flavor of, and has been an element in identifying and codifying modern fantasy in a way that no game and no particular book has ever done before or since. And the fact that Bioware, as a Canadian company, when they were making RPGs, the games that they were making were, you know, based on American properties like Dungeons and Dragons. In fact, the whole RPG basis was based on Dungeons and Dragons to a degree, even, Dra yep. even Dragon Age. I'm not going to argue that Dragon Age was the, their version of a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. In a way, like oh oh, it's it's like the GM who or DM Dungeons and Master who's like oh I I played all these uh, Dungeons and Dragons and now I get the chance to make my own campaign world with my own <laughs> rules. That's what Dun uh, you know Dungeon World yeah Dungeon World was that but that's different. Uh, Dragon Age is right. Another big property they worked with was Kotor Star Wars, right? Yep. E even when they made Jade Empire, which was a uh, supposedly an Oriental-based, Ch mostly Chinese-based RPG, they kind of still did it from the point of view of Americans or North Americans watching action flicks, Chinese action flicks and Asian action cinema, especially Hong Kong cinema, right? That's where they, they, they did the research and all that, but still that's where it comes from, right? Um, Ubisoft, French company. And yet consistently they make games that are, um, they have uh, American uh, characters, mm -hmm. like uh, Ghost Recon was based on, on uh, Tom Clancy series. In fact, they have, they're the ones who own the Tom Clancy name right now for ma making games. Uh, Tom Clancy was a quintessential um, American techno thriller writer. Um, Far Cry. Uh, e well, aside from Far Cry Primal, because literally no nations as, as we recognize them were around at that time, maybe Egypt, maybe Ethiopia, but not so in Europe. Uh, but every Far Cry before and after, I think, has that American um, protagonist. Yep. 
it's sort of something that I believe we brought up in our diversity discussions. It's, uh, I find it interesting that you have you have companies from other places around the world, and yet they all seem to always focus on America. Like, um, all, I believe all of Quadratic Dreams, a French company, mm-hmm. all their games, all American. The Fahrenheit was in New York. Uh, you got Heavy Rain, which was, I think, somewhere in the Midwest. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure, uh, what was it? Beyond Two Souls is also in, takes place somewhere in America. Mm-hmm. And of course, you got Detroit taking place in Detroit. And I, I don't know. Like I, I find that kind of, rest, like sort of restricting yourself, like. Is it is it really that impossible for us as Americans, or do you guys think that we're that ignorant that we couldn't understand someone else's culture? Granted, I'm sure like French modern life culture isn't all that different than Americans, but there's going to be subtleties that are different. Mm-hmm. And I think I almost think back to the case of um, Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, which was a game developed specifically by uh, Square for an American audience because they didn't really think that, you know, Americans were smart enough for Final Fantasy games. Damn. It's why there there is a bunch of Final Fantasy games that never made it originally to the to Western audience because they didn't think they thought they were too hard for a Western audience that oh they wouldn't get it. So mm-hmm. here have like baby's first Final Fantasy game for for our Western audience. And in Japan, it's called Final Fantasy U.S. Mystic Quest. Uh, I mean, a ga- well, game. I know. I keep using that term. You can you can see me doing the the, the quotation marks uh, because I just did. Um, life is life is strange. Mm-hmm. French company, the, I believe. Yep, French company. They take place in um, Seattle, or actually in Washington State, not yeah. Seattle. Which it. A lot of people commented on the uh, the language and all that, especially in the original Life is Strange. Like, do people actually talk that way? But I think in many ways it's a French company trying to emulate a really difficult language. It was teenage language, which is always dated by the time it hits the screen anyway, right? Yeah, uh, we, which is kind of like a step backwards from the first game, which took place in sort of like a dystopian Paris, France, even though... and. I believe some of the NPCs around, if you're walking through, might speak French. But mm. for the most part, like the main character sounded like she sounded American to me. And some of the other NPCs sounded American, despite the fact this is supposed to be France. Yeah. Um, compare that, for example, one area that sort of has resisted this, although they, they clearly influence. I mean, talk about Rockstar Games. Rockstar, especially Rockstar North, is a company that is set in Scotland. And Rockstar Games is a British company. They're the ones, I think, which sort of sh- really show this influence because their games, except for one, which was uh, GTA London, all of them are set in fictional American cities. But what's interesting is that it's clearly the Hollywood version of America whether it's Vice City, whether it's Liberty City in the turn of the century, the 21st century, uh, whether it's Vice City in 1980s, San Andreas in the 90s or today, right? Liberty City today, went back again, or the original games. It's clearly people who are watching America through the lens of Hollywood television and movies and then saying, okay, we're going to make a game about America. And that's why I think many of the extremes of the parodies come in, right? Um, in many ways, they're very accurate, especially when it comes to certain aspects of the geography. They're able to capture it. But a lot of times, you can definitely tell that this is somewhat, this is a foreign look at America. Mm-hmm. But it's so important. American influence, the themes, the ideas, not only in video games, but from other aspects of culture are so important that the most the best selling game in the United in, in the world, well one of them, GTA five, is set in a fictional American city. It's all about American outlook, etc. 
I, mean, uh, I think one of the actors two other, uh, is, is Canadian, and they even make jokes about him being Canadian because he plays the character as a Canadian, but he lives in the United States, and it's all that, right? Uh, yeah. And how thoroughly that is involved, right? How um, you get this at times vicious mockery of the United States as politics, as ideas, and all that, and exaggerations. Although, depending where you go, a store like Ammunition doesn't sound that exaggerated. <laughs> Maybe in downtown LA, but some other place in the United States, not so much. Um, and and yet, at the same time, you know, why not make another GTA London or GTA Hong Kong or something like that, right? Uh, even a game, uh, 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 Watch Dogs, which is set in Hong Kong, right? But the main character is a Chinese American comes from the United States and joins the Chinese police. Uh, you know, he, he was an immigrant, I think from Hong Kong to the United States, grew up there for a while and then comes back again and reconnects with family. So even there you have the going to America and the connection therein, which is very was interesting. It, was so. Watch Dogs in, in Not Watch Hong Dogs. Uh, it was, uh, what? Sleeping dogs. Sleeping dogs, it? yeah. Sleeping dogs. So Sleeping dogs one, because the other one has not uh, come out. Um, it's a definite edition. Which yeah, I might have to it's... get. Um, setting and characters company. They come to bring. I'm reading from the Wikipedia, by the way. Uh, Sorry, a Wei Chen, Wang Yunli, a former San Francisco police officer who was transferred to the Hong Kong police force, assigned to tasks to infiltrate and destroy the triad organization known as the Sun Wong Yi, uh, based on Sun Ying On. The main storyline features a plot to stand balance between completing his missions and the triad, etc. In other words, he is a uh, an American, uh, you know, Chinese descent living in San Francisco, who goes back to Hong Kong, mm -hmm. right? Um, that, I think, even there, and you need that sort of framing of an American to yeah. make the game. Even though, but, and this is a very interesting thing. Is For example, one of the biggest and growing markets in the world for games is China, right? And, yeah. Europe, and Europe is a big market for games as well and other areas. Mexico is also open up as a market and places in South and Latin America are open up and the Caribbean and all that. And yet, and all the talk about diversity, right? But really having like foreign uh, player characters uh, and a non-American view, even by foreign companies, seems to be something that they're very... I'm not, not simply talking about localization. I'm talking about yeah, they're yeah. they're very avoidant of that, and even then, like when it comes to like certain themes too, I think that the game developers don't take an ex a, like a specific stance or go to to an extreme because they don't want to alienate that American market. That um, you just played Far Cry Five not too long ago. That was like a that one had its own controversy because it seemed like that the main that the main antagonists were going to be American, like uh, Christians mm -hmm. of some sort. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they were going to be religious conservatives. But then, once you play it, it was very it was just played safe yeah. compared to what it could have been. In fact, and, it was it was more like a battle between one group of conservatives and another group of conservatives. Like, yeah. It it didn't have like oh it, some uber extreme conservatives that we probably have in this country or you know are extremists mm -hmm. and and have like actual grounded people you know, like hey this could you be this could be you having to deal with these oh no we got to be careful that our country doesn't head this way or we don't let like our country get infiltrated by these fanatics in a larger scale of some sort. Yeah. Like say on a national level instead of a local town level. And, but nope, it's just these wacko people in a cult. 
Yeah, and there's a lot of things that they sort of could have done to sort of build up the tension and stuff like that. Like, you start basically uh, in that game as a sort of a, a direct, almost like an, a Waco, Texas thing, where you're just going to arrest the, the leader, right? But you don't, for example, see protests on the streets, right? You don't mm -hmm. see people, you know, you don't see... I suppose you can say that uh, you see one the, the locals, yeah, are against the cult, but and then you talk about how they bought up the land and all that, but you don't, you don't, it, they just sort of took over. You don't see mm -hmm. the evolution, right? Once you start the game, they're taking over. Yeah, that, that's a that's a fait complete, and you have to liberate the land from them. So a good way of avoiding a lot of these touchy subjects is seeing how people could have actually falling for the cult you don't see i don't like you don't see anybody that you can actually rescue from them right yeah you they also it's not like oh no they didn't really join the cult because of ideology ideological differences it was some magic drug that makes them hallucinate and mind control it's weird it's it's a sort of a, a mix of and there's a, a again even in games where um not said in the united states like um the mythical South Pacific Island or Rook Island. Uh, in Far Cry 3, the main characters, the main character is an American, right? Uh, the uh, Although it has a, the theme that everybody, everything that happens in the island, you know, the island kind of makes all these people that keep invading the island crazy. Americans, Brits, Japanese, Chinese, anybody who comes to the island from the outside eventually gets, sort of goes nuts, right? Goes native. But that itself is not well explained or explored. It just gets avoided. Um, and in Far Cry 4, again, you're mixed, ne basically Nepalese, so they, they have a country, uh, American, right? You were a child, your mother left to the United States, you were raised in the United States, and now you're coming to bury her ashes in this, you know, fish, uh, uh, fictional version of a, of a Himalayan country, right? Um, we're still in America, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that. Um... And again, it comes from Ubisoft, and Ubisoft is a um, a French company. Uh, Watch Dogs, Chicago. I think the other the other game is in San Francisco. This Watch Dogs Two, right? Um, the irony is that you have all these companies out there who are making these games, and yet they are uh, being extremely, in many ways, provincial. Yeah. It there so you're you have companies from around the world making games for a global market and yet it seems like the entire world only takes place in the United States. Yeah. Um I mean, to be honest, yes, the United States is still very much a big um biggest market. Most of the publishers are American. So even if you if, even if the, the developer like Bioware is a foreign developer, technically, or realistically. Uh, they're owned by EA. They're owned by you know Activision, Blizzard. Uh, they're, they're owned by these still American companies who will probably cater to an American first form American market. But for example, with Blizzard, we've seen a move away from that. Sure, Soldier seventy six, which is sort of the basic character, is an American, all American soldier, right? Uh, but they've been doing stuff like, for example, emphasis on the Korean market, emphasis on the Chinese market, like the year of the of the, of the rooster, the year of the dog, right? Uh, having these celebrations, uh, celebrating, for example, the Olympics. I believe it was in Russia or the you know, whatever happened last time, right? Celebrating these things, they're moving into a global market. If they're an American company, they're still moving into a very global market. But the other side of the company, Activision, is still very much focused on America, like right? Call of Duty clearly right so it's mm -hmm. we might be seeing a sea change slowly with the influence of china open this, this stuff up and then we see for example greater grow in india and other places uh we might see changes in this but we're still very much in a sort of culturally dominated by america type game yeah so i would find it interesting because um something uh, that's kind of I wonder, I kind of want to know if this holds true for video games as it does with movies. Is that something I've heard is that a lot of uh, Chinese, like a Chinese audience, actually likes seeing more Americans in their movies? Like they've, I guess they've hold that more as a standard than having actual like Chinese people in their movies. Like one movie 
that came out not too long ago was like the wall mm-hmm. that was based on the 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 great wall of china then it had like monsters attacking it it wasn't like the mongolians but these orc monster things and the leads were american or they were western people yeah but with it was definitely china because there's chinese people there yeah well uh, i'm gonna make i hate making comparisons to movies but i think because we'll talk about influence in mass media and culture during the early 20th century even though the hollywood was the major maker of movies if you watch a lot of the so-called classic movies, a lot of them actually had either British actors or were made in Britain and were dist- distributed by Americans. So the Americans were creating a lot of movies, but a lot of the dramas and stuff like that still had either a lot of British leads or had there was significant output from Britain. And we still kind of have that output. We have like some character, you know, actors from Australia and Britain and stuff mm-hmm. like that, but nowhere near what it used to be. In fact, why am I seeing that in later years now have an inc- increase of them? For, for the most part, you know, the later half of the 20th century, um, it was Americans first and foremost. Uh, American actors, American stories, etc. And that's because there was, just like you mentioned with China, the idea of high art, the idea of refined and art and actors and acting was still attached to Britain, Right. Americans, even though Hollywood was very much a cr- American creation, not movies, mind you, there's a different thing between the creation of movies and, and experimentation with movies and exploring the technology and, and, the ta- and the technique, but rather sort of the turning movies into a true mass market, mass media aspect was very much an American thing, uh, starting with Edison and then later on with Hollywood. And Hollywood, I always thought, is a you know state of mind. There still was this idea that British comedians, British uh, actors, and and seeing the world through a sophisticated lens required a British and particularly English type of view, right? Uh, that waned during the 1950s and 1670s and into the 80s, but now we're seeing in the 21st century sort of a return to that in a, in a way. Marvel doing that, but most of the actors are still American or are British actors that play American roles, right? Um, Australian actors that do American accents and stuff like that. So we might be seeing this change. And I, I expect that as time goes by, you're going to see, you know, South Korean and, and other things. Oh, one aspect of it also, it's that the influence of America is so powerful that it, it has created a sense of wall between the Japanese domestic market and the world market. Because there's a lot of games out there. I was I was doing research on From Software, and I found that From Software did a lot of mech games, uh, giant robot games, and stuff like that. And there's a ton of games, and there's some of that has to do with copyright and Fasa and Robotech and all that, but uh, and Macross. But all this is just that they never make it to the United States. We're now seeing more of them. Like From Software, the big hit they had was, I mean, Armor Core, but was Dark Souls. And Dark Souls, one of the things about Dark Souls is that it's basically very much a, not an American, but certainly a westernized, Jap- a Japanese-made Western RPG. Mm-hmm. Well, it's combat RPG, action RPG. Um, light on the, actually on the role-playing, but heavy on it, on the setting and characters and and, and, and stuff like that. Um, and it was a huge hit, and it was being, you know, the sort of get good mentality and all that. Uh, but... Uh, they made a lot of games that don't make it. In fact, there's a lot of games that don't make it from directly from Japan because they're considered to be quirky and stuff like that. Although now we see, for example, the Persona games are making inroads and stuff like that. But the Yakuza games, um, but still they are the minority. Yeah. And even then, those we kind of have to fight tooth and nail to get because for a long time, there's a lot of games and we still, there's still a lot of games that we don't, get in the west because the publishers or the developers don't feel like it's worth the the time or effort to even make it available to the western market Mm -hmm. even even if they get it's just a matter of like here you can buy it it's not translated it's you have to like read in japanese or whatever native language we made it Mm -hmm. there you go yeah 
No, lo no properly localization, right? Yeah. Uh, even though some of the biggest, you mentioned Final Fantasy, some of the biggest games in America are the Final Fantasy games. Final Fantasy and VII, even, and Final Fantasy XV was huge. Uh, yeah, but uh, but the thing with Final Fantasy XV is that it it probably shifted a lot of uh, its game mechanics. They started kind of doing that with thirteen because in with thirteen, a lot of people didn't like the thirteen because it was made with a lot of uh, oh American audience will like this more mm -hmm. because it's more it's much more easier it's much more linear it's uh, there's no towns and NPCs to talk to all the market. You buy everything from your save points. Mm -hmm. A lot of those decisions that people did not like is because they were trying to make it appeal somehow more to the American market. Yeah. Uh, but I guess they did. It worked out well with 15 because everyone seems to love that. Yeah. And and 15 is, again, it's a sort of very, it's a rare mix of East and West, right? Some of the archetypes are clearly Eastern, and some archetypes are clearly Western. Like the main character is pretty much an an anime, you know, emo boy, right? Even at the end when he gets his beard, it's sort of like this very scratchy beard that it, that that very much Japanese, right? But his girlfriend is this blonde, blue-eyed, skinny girl, right? That could have walked out of Vogue or something, right? Vogue, Teen Vogue or something. So, and then also the peculiarities of the Japanese market, etc. But but there you have it, right? Um, and I think uh, we might be, I think for we'll probably see American influence on the market for a very long time. But I think Blizzard is also pointing the way to, to more of this. And also, I think companies like Sony, if they want to have more exclusives in the future, I think they will be um, tempted to just take these Japanese games, which were are, are by definition exclusive to them because mm -hmm. the Xbox has never made many major inroads in Japan anyway, and put them out to the West just, just so, so they can pad their exclusive uh, library. And the success of Persona games, success of Jakusa, and, and other trains, I think, will change things somewhat. But... It also requires companies taking risk, and big publishers don't like to take risk. I think that's ultimately what it is. You said it before with Far Cry. It's all about risk taking, and playing to the American market and playing to American taste. It still feels safe, ultimately. So there you mm -hmm. go. So that's what we have for you in our Fourth of July uh, uh, America. Uh, America, America, fuck yeah! Uh, podcast. If you want to sh know more about my co-host, where we can find you on the interweb, Chapman. You can find me at Chapman pretty much everywhere. I am Chapman underscore on uh, Twitch and Twitter, and you can find me at Chapman on YouTube. And of course, you can find me here, Lessons Learned One, on Twitch and Lessons Learned on YouTube, where I often put. Uh, this and other rebroadcasts of Twitch. Basically, that's what YouTube channel is these days. It's just me rebroadcasting. I'm looking always to expand the um, the the stable of of things and shows and that I do on Twitch. That's my now my preferred platform. And I'm gonna keep harping on this before I go to, uh, finish the show. I I was two, and now we're three down for the you know for the 50 that are required to hit affiliate so if you like this podcast either you see it on a vod or you see it on youtube or you see it here live and you like it share it uh invite it invite your friends the more uh followers i have the better so thank you all for coming and we will see you when we see you bye good night <laughs>